Alrighty, so in this video I'm going to take a look at some physics challenge style questions on the thermal physics topic. Uh, this for IGCSE sort of level. So a kettle with a power rating of 2, two kilowatts takes 1.4 minutes to raise the temperature of 500 grams of water from 20 degrees to 100 degrees. Calculate the specific heat capacity of water. Okay, so let's start off with that one. So uh, we can work out the total amount of energy we've supplied to the heater, assuming it's 100% efficient. And then once we've done that, we can rearrange Q equals MC delta T to calculate specific heat capacity, uh, remembering to turn the mass of water into kilograms. And that should come out as a number that you recognize because this gets used all the time, 4,200 joules per kilogram per Kelvin or joules per kilogram per degree centigrade. OK, so let's move on to the second part. Some hot water is added to three times its mass of water at 10 degrees, and the resulting temperature is 20 degrees centigrade. Calculate the temperature of the water. So, uh, what I'm gonna do here is, whatever we do when we mix two liquids, they'll eventually become the same temperature. And what that means is the energy lost by the hot liquid must be equal to the energy gained by the cold. So on the left hand side here, we've got the energy lost by the hot liquid with, and I've called its mass M. And then we've got the energy gained by the cold, which has mass 3M because it's three times the mass. The, they're both water, so they both have the same specific heat capacity. So we can cancel out C's, can cancel out the M's, rearrange to calculate T, and it turns out it's 50 degrees centigrade. OK, so when a metal bar is cooled, it contracts. Which statement is true? Density and mass decreases. No, mass is not affected by heating something. Its volume or size can change, and therefore its density can change, but mass is not affected. Uh, so A is not correct. Uh, it B says mass stays the same, which looks good. Density decreases. Uh, no, that's what happens when you... <laughs> If you heat an object, its density decreases. If you cool it, its density increases. Volume increase? No, its volume would decrease. Density doesn't change, as D says, so that's not right. So then it must be E. Mass stays the same, density increases because it occupies a smaller volume. Water in a central heating system enters a 10 kilowatt boiler at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius and leaves at a temperature of 60 degrees. If 4,200 joules of energy is needed to increase the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius, how much water flows through the boiler each second? Okay, so let's uh, break this down. So I'm going to calculate the amount of energy we supply in one second. So if it's 10 kilowatts, that's 10,000 joules every second. The amount of heat energy to increase one kilogram by that temperature change would be uh, 147,000. So to calculate the actual mass, I'm going to do the 10,000 divided by the energy to raise one kilogram, and that gives us the mass in kilograms, which is 68 grams, or option D. Okay. Expanded polystyrene consists of cells of trapped air. This is a much better insulator than free air because moving air can transfer heat by, well, if it's moving, that means convection is an option because that's the uh, what's going to happen. Uh, we could still have the process of conduction or radiation if it's stationary. Um, okay. Calculate the kinetic energy of an asteroid of mass 8 times 10 to the 12 kilograms, approaching Earth at a speed of 4 kilometers per second. Uh, fairly simple, just use k equals half mv squared, and we get the kinetic energy. Calculate the energy necessary to heat a lake of volume 2 times 10 to the 8 from 15 degrees centigrade to 100 degrees centigrade, given that 1 kilogram of water requires 4,000 joules to raise the temperature by 1 degree, and the density is 1,000. So, First thing we're going to do is calculate the mass using the volume and the density. And then once we've got the mass, we can use the specific heat capacity and the temperature change to calculate the thermal energy you need to supply. Okay. 
Calculate the gravitational potential energy gained by a square consonant of area 3,500 kilometers by 3,500 kilometers and a depth of 10 kilometers. The rock has a density of 2,500 kilograms per meter cubed, and when it's raised through a height of one kilometer, the gravitational field strength is 10 newtons per kilogram. Okay. So to calculate change in GP, we need to do mg delta h, and we're going to calculate the mass the same way we did before using density times volume. Uh, we need to remember to convert all of these kilometers into meters, uh, so that's uh, four of them we need to multiply by a thousand to convert them, and then when we do that, we get a GP, a very, very big change in GP, which is why this doesn't happen too often, of 3.1 times 10 to the 24. From your answers to B and C, determine by calculation the effect of an asteroid hitting a lake with a thousand times the volume of water and striking a continent. Okay, so um, if we look at the amount of the energy the asteroid has, it's considerably or a little bit less than the energy that we supplied in the question. So I'm going to do the ratio of those two times by the temperature change we got with the 7.14, and that would give us a temperature change of 76 degrees Celsius. So we'd still get uh, quite a big temperature change from all of the energy of the asteroid, uh, Okay, even though we have a thousand times more water. Okay, with the next one, I'm going to use the same process, uh, but the energy difference is quite a bit different. So we've got an order of magnitude between the difference between the 6.4 and the 3.1 of 10 to the 5. So um, when once we plug those numbers in, we can see we only get a height change this time of about 2.1 centimeters, um, which is considerably sort of almost negligible. So asteroids, yes, they create craters, but they're not realistically going to lift your uh, continent in any in significant way. Okay, so we've got a diagram showing an electrical immersion heater in a cylinder of water. Two thermometers A and B are placed in the same positions shown, and the heater is switched on for a finite time. Sketch on the same axis graphs of the two temperatures A and B against time. Okay, so the key thing is that A is above the heater and B is below. So that's going to give us our difference. So what that means is A can be receiving thermal energy by convection current, whereas B uh, realistically is not going to receive uh, energy from convection currents is just going to by, be by conduction through the liquid mostly anyway. So A is going to very quickly start to increase in temperature because convection currents are set up very quickly and it's going to receive energy at a higher rate which is why it's got a steeper gradient. B won't start receiving energy for a period of time. Conduction is pretty inefficient in a liquid but after a long period of time, they should both reach the same temperature, because remember, in a system, given a long period of time, everything reaches the same temperature. It's just that A will get there in a shorter period of time. Okay, so a three kilowatt kettle contains 500 grams of boiling water. The amount of energy required to turn one kilogram of water at 100 degrees into steam is 2,270 kilojoules. The best estimate for the time taken for a kettle to boil dry is... Okay, so we can do the calculations for this. So the thermal energy supplied, we can do power times time. And the amount of energy is Q equals ml. So those two are going to be equal to each other. We are rearranged to make T the subject. Plug the numbers in, remembering to convert from kilojoules into joules and from kilowatts into watts, and that gives us 378 seconds, which is about 6.3 minutes. So the closest option we have here is C, because uh, realistically we're going to lose some energy to the surroundings, so the time would be slightly longer. Okay, so a 3 kilowatt kettle can bring one litre of cold tap water initially at 15 degrees Celsius to the boil in two minutes. This suggests the approximate value for specific heat capacity of tap water of... Okay, so I'm going to use the fact that one litre of water is one kilogram, because one centimetre cubed is one gram. Uh, so we know the mass is one. 
Uh, we're going to use similar principles to what we used before. So Q equals PT, and this time Q equals MC delta T. And we, this time we're rearranging to make C the subject. We plug the numbers in. We remember to go from kilowatts to watts, and that gives us our specific heat capacity, which tallies up with option B. Okay, so the specific heat capacity of a material is defined as the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of the material by one degree Celsius. When a thousand joules of thermal energy is transferred to 200 grams of material X, the temperature increases by four degrees. When 2000 joules of thermal energy is transferred to 100 kilograms of material Y, the temperature increases by eight degrees. The ratio of their specific heat capacities X to Y is Okay, so what I've done here is I've made expressions for each of the two. So for the first one, we supplied a thousand joules. There were 200 grams and it went up by four degrees. For the second one, there are 2000 joules for 100 grams and it went up by eight degrees. So that gave me values for C1 and C2. And you can see that the specific heat capacity of Y is double that of X. So it's option D. Okay, some, some students investigate the amount of energy available from solar radiation. For their first experiment, they use a child's outdoor paddling pool, which is 4 metres in diameter and 20 centimetres deep. Cold water is allowed to flow in to one side of the pool at a rate of 20 litres per minute, and the same amount of water overflows from the other side of the pool, uh, so 20 litres per minute. Uh, the water in the pool mixes evenly, so it's all heated by the energy from the sun and the ball pool is in thermal equilibrium and that just means it's all at the same temperature. On a good sunny day the sun provides energy to raise the temperature of the water entering and leaving the pool that is the water flowing out of the pool is warmer than the water flowing in. The students measure a temperature rise of three degrees celsius. So given the specific heat capacity is 4200, calculate the energy from the sun received by the 20 litres of water between entering and leaving it. So that's a lot of information to do a Q equals MC delta T calculation. We've got 20 litres, which is 20 kilograms, and then we've got a three degree temperature change it gives us our energy. Okay, so therefore calculate the solar power per square metre falling on the surface of the pool. So we just calculated the amount of energy supplied to each 20 kilograms, but we're told that there are 20 kilograms per minute moving through the material, the, the pool. So first of all, solar power per square metre is also known as intensity, so that's why there's an I in there. So we're going to do, need to do, intensity is power per unit area. Power is energy supplied per unit time. So we calculated the energy, we know it's one minute, and the area we're going to get doing pi r squared gives us an intensity or a power per square metre of 334 watts per metre squared. So just why the value calculated is likely to be too low? Uh, well, the water is likely to have lost some energy to the surroundings, which would have meant it would have had a, a, a bit a larger temperature rise if it hadn't had it, which would mean that a larger solar intensity is probably expected there. Okay. So for a second investigation, the students using a photovoltaic solar cell connected in simple circuit as shown. So the solar cell is in the same, same sunlight as in the first investigation. In this investigation, the following measurements are made. So we've got the dimensions 15 by 15, and we're assuming, so basically it's a square. Uh, the current is 200 milliamps, the voltage is 7 volts. Calculate the power per square meter generated. So to get power, we're going to use P equals IV, and then once we've got power, we can divide that by the area to give us the intensity of 62 watts per meter squared. So using that value, calculate the efficiency. So we know the actual intensity is 334 watts per meter squared, but we didn't get that from our calculation. So if we get the value we calculated, divide it by the expected value, we can see we've got an efficiency of 0.19, uh, which actually for a solar cell is not too bad. That's actually pretty good intent, uh, efficiency for a solar cell. Okay, so the students find the following facts about solar radiation on Earth. Uh, the power 
per meter squared is also known as intensity. Uh, we discussed that already. Above the atmosphere, the intensity is 1.4 kilowatts, or 1,400 watts per meter squared. The intensity of solar radiation is related to power output of the sun. By the equation, intensity equals power divided by 4 pi r squared, which if you don't know, is the surface area of a sphere, 4 pi r squared, uh, where r is the distance between the Earth and the sun. So given that the distance is 150 times 10 to the 6 kilometers, calculate the power output. So we already know the, in the intensity, because we uh, are given it there, 1,400. So times by 4 pi times the distance in meters squared gives us 4 times 10 to the 26 watts. Finally, the student researches the use of photovoltaic solar cell panels to generate electricity for satellites. Assuming the electric well, solar panels of a satellite in orbit around the Earth are 40% efficient, calculate the surface area of the solar panels required to produce an electrical output power of 200 watts. Okay, so uh, if we know that they're 40% efficient, we're going to need to do 200 divided by 0.4 to work out the how much energy they must receive. We then divide that by the intensity and that will tell us the area that's required 0.36 meters squared. So I basically just rearrange the intensity equation. Calculate the surface area of similar solar panels needed to generate 200 watts of power for a similar satellite in orbit around Jupiter at 780 times 10 to the 6 kilometers from the Sun. Uh, so it says, hint, calculate the intensity of solar radiation for that distance. So let's do that. So we, know, we now know the power emitted by the Sun. We've got that. And we've got the new distance from the Sun, which is converted into meters, giving us an intensity of 52 watts per meter squared. And once we know the intensity, we can repeat the same process we went through before, but this time the, the intensity is 52, so we'd actually need a much bigger array, 9.6 meters squared on Jupiter, because it's so much further away. Okay, final question. Heat loss from the house can be reduced by using double glazing. Explain how double glazing reduces heat loss from a warm room to the colder outside environment. Okay, so... Uh, double glazing reduces the process of conduction. That's what the idea behind the design is. So you've got two planes of glass with either an air gap or if you want a really expensive one, a vacuum gap between them. And the reason we do that is because an air or a vacuum is a really good insulator or another way of saying that is a terrible conductor. So the other thing that would help reduce heat loss is actually reflection. So glass is shiny, which you should know mean makes you a good reflector of infrared radiation. So if there's twice as much glass, because we've got two of them in a row, you're gonna reflect twice as much infrared radiation uh, than you would have before, ignoring that the second plane of glass might reflect, then reflect it back and we get some sort of loop there, uh, which some of it inevitably would do. And and that finishes looking at these thermal physics physics challenge GCSE level questions.